Book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 is where you'll find me uh, today. Book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 as we continue in our series journeying through Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 10, Paul speaks these words. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Uh, Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need. I, for I have learned, uh, that's a, that's a, that's an important word, underline that, I've learned. Everybody say learned. learned. To be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned. There it is again. Somebody shout learn. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, uh, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. May God add a blessing to the hearers and the readers of God's word. 1844, young Elijah McCoy was born. Uh, He was born in Ontario, Canada, the son of fugitive slaves that, by way of the Underground Railroad, fled Kentucky and found their way up north. Um, He, being the son of these fugitive slaves that found their way up north, Uh, Once they settled up north, it was clear to his parents that he had an exceptional gift. He had a special gift. He had the gift of intelligence. He had this, this, this blessed gift. And so they said, let's send him off to Edinburgh, Scotland to study, to study engineering. He once completed his studies there. He was certified as a mechanical engineer. Once finishing his studies, he made his way to where his parents had settled there in Michigan. They were there in Michigan, and there he began to look for a job as a mechanical engineer. Unfortunately, during that time, the racial tensions and the racial realities of the culture of the day would not afford him the opportunity to get a job as a certified mechanical engineer. He had to settle to be an oilsman at Michigan Central Railroad. Um, And it was there at the railroad where he took his first job. This was during the industrialization of America. Uh, Historians would say that the economy would rise or fall, would live or die based off of the success or failure of the railroad. Uh, It was all about the railroads during this time. However, uh, our trains had a problem, oil, oil. During this time, the locomotive could only run a few miles before having to stop, unload a crew. They would have to go oil the wheels in order for the train to continue going. Well, this would cause profit loss significantly. Some would even say they lost upwards of millions of dollars a day because of this process. Um, However... Young Elijah McCoy was determined to figure out a solution. He would work months and months in the lab after his work was done to try to figure out a way to solve this problem. Ultimately, he would invent the McCoy lubricating cup. This would be a cup that would be placed over the wheel that would continuously drip oil on the wheels, allowing the locomotive to go to its full destination without having to stop. Well, it was a phenomenon. It was all the rage. You couldn't find a train during that time that did not have the McCoy lubricating cup. Only one problem, counterfeits. There were counterfeits that started to pop up all across the country, but the problem with the counterfeits is they were no good. They, they could not 
duplicate uh, the, the cup that young Elijah had created. They, they, they failed miserably. As a matter of fact, the counterfeits were so bad when owners would go to try to, buy, uh, to try to buy the cup, they would beg the question, and it was common for them to ask this question, is this a counterfeit or is this the real McCoy? Culture is begging the question as they canvas over the body of Christ and look at Christianity. There's so many counterfeits. There's so many people that name the name of Jesus Christ, but not walking in the fullness of who he is and what he's called us to do. So much so that the question has to be begged. The question has to be asked, Willow, are we counterfeits or are we the real McCoy? Are we walking in true, authentic Christianity? Have we really committed to being true followers of Jesus, are we living as counterfeits? Christian authenticity is what I'm getting at. There's an there's a authenticity that we should see and illuminate in our lives. And Paul, in our passage, gives us a glimpse, gives us a marker, gives us an indicator of Christian authenticity. There is something that should show up in every Christian that Paul is saying, look at my life and see this and model this. Christian authenticity should be marked by godly contentment, by godly contentment. Your ability to rest in who God is and what he's done and to be all good. I'm sorry, all good is a, a colloquialism. To be all good is to be uh, at peace, at rest, a uh, whole with oneself and trusting in God. Somebody say all good. Somebody turn to your name and say, are you all good? This, this vision of contentment is, is, is the idea, and Paul will say it in so many words. He'd say, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be all good. I've learned to be all good. I've, I've learned that as long as God is on the throne, I can be all good. Turn around and ask another neighbor, are you all good? He, he says a mark of following Jesus Christ is finding your place in contentment and being all good. Is it raining outside? I'm all good. Is it snowing outside? I'm all good. Is the sun shining outside? I'm all good because of Christ and who he is in my life. There's this thing that's called fair weather Christians. They mostly come from California. It's this idea that as long as the weather is fair, then I'm fair, then I'm good. Today, for the next few moments, I want to proposition you. I want to, I want to push you. I want to challenge you. I want to ask the question, are you an authentic follower of Jesus Christ? Are you the real McCoy? Have you committed to following him regardless of the storm? Or are you a fair weather Christian? Are you a counterfeit? I don't, I don't want Jesus to have to appeal from the balcony of heaven and say, is this a counterfeit or is this the real McCoy? Paul says one of the biggest indicator lights is contentment. Are you content? Are you anxious? Are you restless? Are you stressed? Are you consumed with worry? Are you consumed with just discontent and dissatisfaction? Are you going through a storm? And have you found to be content despite your situation? The three quick lessons that I just want to give you, three quick ones, three quick ones, that means whenever a preacher talks about how quick he's going to be, nine times out of ten, he's going to be really, really long. Um, so girl, girl, go and take them shoes off. Um, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be quick. There, there are three things I need you to understand about contentment that Paul displays. Three quick things. Number one, contentment does not come from good times. Contentment does not come from good times. If you're not careful, you'll tell yourself, you'll, you'll, you'll start answering the question, how you doing? I'm good. Well, why are you good? Because everything's just going good. Everything's just going good. No, 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 no. Contentment doesn't come from everything going good. Because Paul will tell you there are times when things ain't going to go good. Following Jesus doesn't mean every day going to be good. 
Some of us, we come to Jesus and we have this bad off view of who he is. We've got this bless me, bless me theology where we think every day walking with Jesus, the sun is going to shine, my breath will never stink, everything's going to be always great, I'll always be a size two. Let me tell you something, following Jesus ain't going to do that to you. Following Jesus ain't going to do that to you. There, there are good times, but Jesus wants to warn you, don't put too much stock in good times. As a matter of fact, in the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew, he says, don't lay up treasures in this world. He says, be careful, be careful. When things start going good, don't start putting eternal expectations on temporal realities. Oh, that was good. Let me say it again to this side. Let me say that again. Don't, don't put eternal, don't, don't start putting too much hope in stock in things that ain't going to last forever. Your car ain't going to save you. Your money, as much as you have, ain't going to keep you. Because one day, all those things will fade away. I said, it'll all fade away. Turn around and tell your neighbor, it's going to all fade away. I know you just got those new shoes and they looking all cute and you was feeling yourself in the mirror today. You even took a selfie, new shoes, hashtag going to church to praise the Lord. I know, I know you feeling those shoes, but they're going to fade away. It's going to all fade away. And God says, don't put your hope, don't put your contentment on stuff that's going to fade away. You're not going to take it. That new car you got, as much as you love it, when you drive it, it makes you feel so good. You be driving, you're like, oh, I'm the bomb, 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 uh, I'm the bomb. Uh. I know. You just, you, 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 you feel so confident in a car. But listen, you can't take that car with you. When you die, they ain't going to have your casket and then a big old car behind you with I'm the bomb on the tag. It ain't going to work that way. You can't take it with you. Although there are some in history who have tried. Y'all, y'all heard about the husband who told his wife, when I die, I want to take all my money with me. He, he, he seriously said, I want you to take all my money and put it in this casket with me. I'm taking it all with me. Now, I don't know what's crazier, the fact that he asked for it or the fact that she agreed to it. She said, yeah, okay, no problem. And her family was like, girl, are you crazy? She was like, listen, I want to honor my husband. I want to be obedient to what he asked for me. So he, he got really, really sick, and he passed away. And he was making sure, you, I want all my money in the cash. She, she says, honey, you don't have anything to worry about. So after the funeral service, everything's over. Her family comes to her and says, girl, you didn't do it for real, did you? She, she looked at me, and she said, I want to honor my husband. My husband, while he lived, he was so good to me. He cared for me, he provided for me, and I want to honor him in his request at his death. So I took the time and I wrote him a check and I put it in there. <laughs> put the check in there. Now it's up to him whether he cashes it or not. That's up to him. I ain't got... That's his business. I ain't got nothing to do with that. Let me tell you something. Contentment is not going to come from your things. It's not going to come from the things of this world. And what this world offers, it's so elusive. What this world offers is not eternal contentment, but seasonal contentment at best. You'll feel good about something until you see something, somebody with something else. I, I don't know if you like this. Even on, on big levels and small levels. I was, I'd be at the restaurant. I, I know you're too saved to do stuff like this. But I was at the restaurant. I got my plate, and I was content. I love what I ordered until I saw what they ordered. <laughs> I said, now look at that. Now that looked good. Now that, uh, now, that, now that looked way better than what I got. Now what? And I'd be mad at the waiter. Why you didn't tell me y'all had that? I didn't even see that. You ever be with somebody, they get mad. They be like, no, I didn't even see that on the menu. Did anybody, did anybody even say that? I don't even want this. I got it. This it don't even look good no more. I don't even, I don't even want my food. You were content until you saw what somebody else had. Be careful, that's what the world will do to you. You'll be content until you see somebody else with something else. You loved your car. Your car was fine until you saw that commercial. Now, my car don't do that. Now, why you didn't tell me? Now, see, this, see this, that's what I really wanted. See, this, this, and now you got your car. You ain't even thankful for the car you got no more. 
I thought I looked good coming out the house. Then I saw this sign, this billboard for skinny jeans. And the billboard started talking to me and says, Albert, you need skinny jeans. And I said, I'm too fat to have skinny jeans. He says, no, you're not. That's why we call them skinny. They make fat people look skinny. So I started looking at my pants and says, these, these don't even look good no more. I don't even like these pants. I want skinny jeans. He says, yes, you need to have skinny jeans. And I said to the skinny jeans sign, I said, well, if my bottom's going to be skinny, what's going to happen to my top? Do you have skinny tops? <laughs> and then the, the billboard stopped talking. It just went silent on me. I don't know what happened, but <laughs> notice how you will have and be content. You'll be having a good day feeling good about you, who you are until you look on Instagram. You look on Facebook and you see what somebody else has. You see what someone else is doing. Contentment doesn't come from things. It doesn't come from things. And this world will offer you seasonal contentment at best. And you'll feel good about what you have until you see what somebody else, is, what, what somebody else has. Ultimately, good things, they don't give you contentment, number one, because you can have all the things in the world and still be empty. I'll say that again, because we're coming up on the holiday season. You can have all the things in this world, but still be empty. One of the gospel writers says it this way. He says, what profit a man to gain the whole world, but still lose their soul? The thing that captures me about that verse is not that he lost his soul, but that he gained the world. This is a picture of someone that's extremely successful. You mean to tell me I can be extremely successful in this world and be a complete failure in the kingdom? Mm, that was good. I'm going to say that again. You can win it all and be completely wrong. You can be successful in this world, applauded in this world. Girl, you doing it, bro. Keep holding it down, bro. And do that, and heaven is silent. You can win in this world but lose in the kingdom. It reminds me of when I was in seminary. I, um, I, I'm a different kind of student. You know, I... I go about my studies a different kind of way. You got those kinds of students that, you know, read the syllabus. Uh, they, you know, put down when papers are due and they turn their papers in, you know, on time. You know, you, you got overachievers like that. And, but then you got people like me who I like to live by the spontaneity of the Spirit of God. Um, I, I like to be Spirit-led with my academic studies and and I don't know when I talk about being spirit-led, I float around on the stage, but it feels like that's what needs to happen. <laughs> Anybody else spirit-led in your studies like me? Anybody else follow, just follow? That's how, you, that's how I did school. Uh, some of you, that's how you finished college, and some of you, that's how you didn't finish college. <laughs> but but I, 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 I have to admit, when you live in spirit-led like that, it leads itself to what I call awkward moments. Uh, there have been, if I'm honest, if I tell the truth, there have been times when I walked in class and I look around. Everybody got a paper on their desk. I'll be like, we got a paper due today? <laughs> I'll be back. Uh, <laughs> so I never forget one time I'm studying and my, my backpack falls open and my syllabus just kind of lays open. It just kind of lays open and it's right there. And I look and I see I got a paper due next week and I know about it early. Praise the Lord. The Spirit has spoken. <laughs> Spirit has led me here to this place. So I do my paper, and y'all, I'm not going to lie, I killed it. I mean, it was, it was a masterpiece. I, 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 I just did it. To be honest, it was so good. I went in my professor's office. You shouldn't do this. But I walked in, and I was like, this is an A waiting to happen, Jack. You ain't even got to grade it and walked out the class. <laughs> so when he's passing out the papers, I... I He's passing out the papers, and I'm, I'm not even looking at mine. I'm just looking at everybody else thinking, if he grading this on the curve, I put the curve through the roof, Jack. I put it through the roof. Uh, finally, I get my paper. They don't put the grades at my school on the front page. They put it on the back, so you read through all the comments. So, but I already see it. I already see the first page. I already see big red letters, great content. I'm thinking, I know. <laughs> you ain't got to tell me. I wrote it. I tried to tell you. Last page, big red circle, in the middle, big red letter, F. <laughs> Wrong assignment. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say, I want to warn you against the reality for some will be they'll stand before God one day and he'll say great content. 
you got it all right. You accomplished all that stuff down there. But wrong assignment. Because you weren't content in me. <laughs> Contentment doesn't come from good things. The second thing I need you to know is bad things don't take away from contentment. Contentment doesn't come from good things, but also you need to understand bad things don't take away from contentment. If you don't believe me, just listen to Paul. Paul is sitting there, and I'm sorry, he's having the epitome of a bad day. He's writing from prison on death row. They're threatening to literally cut his head off, and he says, give me a, give me a papyrus and a pen, and he's in prison writing, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Have you lost your mind, Paul? Like you are in prison, you are, this is the worst of the worst circumstances. And you're sitting, writing to the church at Philippi, saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Encouraging to have joy. As a matter of fact, if you were to sum the book of Philippians up in two words, it's joy, joy. And he's in prison. What he's trying to get you to understand is don't allow a bad thing to take you out of the good place that God has put you in, and that is in his will where his will is providing for you. He's, he's obviously got something that we don't get because logically, he should not have a good attitude. Logically, he should not be encouraged. But what we don't understand is that he has a peace that passes logic. He has a peace that passes understanding. You take your circumstances and you add your, 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 your storm and then you add your, your struggle and then you add disappointment and you add the devastation, that should not equal joy. That should not equal joy. Some of you, you look at your life and once you add up all the things you're going through, it does not equal joy. You are discouraged, you are living in despair and you should be because logically that's what adds up. But what he says is you're missing the great common denominator and if you take your discouragement, your storm, your struggle, your circumstance and you add Jesus, it equals joy. Ah, oh, I wish I had some folk that had some joy in here this morning. I don't care what you got going in your life. If you just add Jesus, you might find some joy today. If you add Jesus, you might find a new attitude. If you add Jesus, you might find joy in the midst of your storm. He says, I've given you a peace that don't fit in the equation. It doesn't follow logic. It's a peace that passes understanding. Girl, why are you smiling? It don't make sense. Brother, how are you encouraged? It don't make sense. Sis, how in the world do you have your head lifted up with all the hell you're going through? And you can say, yeah, I'm going through hell, but the key word is through. I'm going through. I ain't staying there. Jesus is coming to bring me out, and he's giving me a peace as I walk through the journey. Anybody got peace this morning? Anybody trusting in the Lord? Anybody said it don't make sense. I shouldn't be praising God, but because I got a peace, I can praise him. I shouldn't be clapping my hands, but because I got peace, I can clap my hands and give God glory. He says you got to get a new perspective on what peace is. You got to see peace for what it is. There's a story of a community that wanted to illuminate peace in their neighborhood. And so they commissioned two artists to paint a picture that depicts the idea of peace. The first artist reveals his painting. And oh, he, he's got it. He paints a picture of the ocean. And the ocean is still. It's, it's not... It's, a, it's as if it's not even moving. It is, it is the epitome of stillness. And the picture just looks as if the sound is quiet. Cascading across the sky and the horizon, you see these beautiful orange streaks as the sun peaks above the horizon with this rays of beautiful sunlight. And as if it couldn't get more tranquil, there are two doves that appear to just be floating over the surface of the ocean. And you can look in, and it almost, it almost looks like they're singing beautiful melodies of peace. It looks clear that he had captured everyone's heart and idea of peace. Then the second artist reveals his painting, 
And there's a gasp in the room. They, they gasp in the room because he too has decided to paint the ocean, but his ocean is violent. The, the waves look as if they are literally fighting each other, and the water is gray instead of this beautiful blue. And as he looks over the horizon, it's shades of darkness as the sun is refusing to shine over the horizon. And with the raging waters, with clear wind seems to be blowing, and with this dark horizon. It was clear almost that he missed the right prompt. He, he totally got it wrong. It is almost as if he was painting the opposite of peace. And just when they decided to dismiss, just before they decided to dismiss his entry, they noticed two rocks jettison out of the ocean. And sitting on the rocks were these two doves. And as you lean in, as you see the doves, they look as though they don't have a care in the world. They're sitting there in the midst of the raging storm, standing on the rock with a completely calm face. Well, it was clear who the winner was. The first painting showed that peace was the absence of storm and wind and trouble. However, the second painting captured the true essence of peace. Peace is not the absence of trial, storm, and bad weather and struggle. Peace is that in the midst of storm, in the midst of trial, in the midst of struggle, as long as I stand on the rock, I can still have peace. Oh, Willow, if you get it early, I won't have to preach as long. You can have peace in the middle of the storm. You just got to find the rock. And if you stand on the rock, you can have peace. Has anybody ever found the rock? Anybody ever had to stand on the rock in the midst of hard times? If you just stand on the rock, he'll keep you in perfect peace. He'll keep you in perfect peace. You ain't got to have the storm to end. You just got to find the rock in the midst of the storm. Paul is saying, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned what it is to have a lot. I've learned what it is to have a little. Some of you, you on a spiritual roller coaster, you go up or down. You walk in the house, they can tell whether you had a bad day or not before you open your mouth. Because you come in with all the attitude when you had a bad day, and then you come in with all the drama when you had a good day. Holy Spirit says, you need to relax, chill, get some consistency in your life. Not only does the Holy Spirit say that, but your wife says it too, and your roommate, and your husband. He says, I've learned to be consistent. I've learned to be content. I found the precious secret, and it's not in good times. And I've learned the secret because in bad times come, I can still be content in bad times. It's not found in good times. Bad times don't take away contentment. And the last thing I need you to understand is contentment ain't found in you. It's not something you bring out of yourself. Because some of us, you're good. Oh, you're good. You'll work hard, and you'll sit on the throne of your own life, and you'll say, oh, I'm going to be content. I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to plan well, and I'm going to get everything right. And you're what you are is you're a control freak. <laughs> Come on, that's what you are. You're a control freak. Any control freaks in the house? Anybody want to admit it? Oh, let me, let me ask a better question. Anybody sitting next to a control freak that you want to tell the truth about? Oh, come on. See there? Your marriage just got some deliverance. Your, they just looked down the row at mom and said, that's you, mom. That's you, mom. And some of you just looking straight ahead because you don't want to get in trouble. But you know if you had the freedom, you would be like, that's you. But I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going to look straight ahead and act like it ain't you. Some of us, we master this and we think as long as we will it to be so, as long as we try hard, we can be content. As long as we work hard, as long as we're really disciplined, as long as I do my to-dos and set my goals and go after my initiative, what you're doing is you're trying to control your life. And you're thinking that you can find contentment in your own ability, and you can't. You can't find contentment in yourself because what happens when you fail? What happens when you miss the mark? What you're doing is you're setting yourself up to be your own God. Setting yourself up to control your own life. And then some of us, we'll even take it to the level to where we'll try to control God. We'll try to control, it's like this, sir, would you come up here and help me out real quick? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, come on up, hurry up. Y'all give him a hand as he comes, come on. Yeah, come on. Come here. Some of us, what we do is we say, Lord, I want to give you my life. This, this, is, this stool is my life, and, and I want to invite God. 
Come on, on the stage. Come on. Uh, how you doing, brother? What's your name? Roman. Roman? All right. You're going to be God for about five seconds. Um, <laughs> and we say, we say, God, I want you to sit on the throne of my life, and I'm going to bow at the feet of God, and I'm going to worship you, God. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Oh, God. Thank you so much. And so we say we worship God, and God, I love you so much. God, you are just in control of my life. I'm just so thankful for you. I'm just, oh, God, it's just so good to have you in my life. Oh, no, I got a bad report at the doctor. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus, I need you, Lord, Lord. God, huh. oh, the test came back negative. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm healthy. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You are so good, God. I'm so, you are you are so faithful. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, oh, I got a, I got a, my job, my job's in jeopardy. Oh, I got to meet with my boss. My boss said, what? Uh, oh, I'm doing a good job? I'm getting a promotion? Praise the Lord. God is so good. Thank you so much, Jesus. This is so, oh man, this is great. Uh, it's so good to have you in my life. Ooh, uh, this is so good. That's so good. Everything's going away. God, you know, I've been single for a long time. I, I need a woman in my life. Lord, would you, would you, wait, hold on. Let me pick her first. Um, yeah, Wendy, Lord. Let, let, Wendy, Lord, would you, would you bless would you bless me and Wendy's uh, dating relationship, Lord? Thank you so much. We, we thank you, God, me and Wendy doing so great, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wendy's, oh, Wendy crazy, Jesus, Lord, Wendy, Lord, take her back, Lord. Where'd she come from, Jesus? She crazy. She lost her mind, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Some of you, this is you. This is you. You try to find contentment. You say you find it in Jesus but you're really trying to find it in yourself. And some of you, you're too theologically astute. You say, Albert, I'm not a heretic. I would never ask Jesus to get off the throne. Oh, you may not ask him to get off, but you'll ask him to scoot over. Scoot over, Jesus. Just let me get, let me just get, can I just get up here too? Let me, if I could just get one cheek out the deal, Jesus. If I, come on, if we could just work together, we, we'd be on the same team. Just scoot over. Let's come on. Okay, you get a, Okay, let's get in here. All right. Okay. Okay, there we go. Jesus, this is great. This is a wonderful relationship. I just got a cheek in here. Praise the Lord. Listen, let me tell you something. God didn't die on the cross to give you a cheek. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that he can be fully enthroned in your life. He ain't trying to share the seed. He's trying to own the seed so he might reign in the seed. You all understand what I'm saying in here? Thank you, Roman. Thank you. Y'all give Roman a hand. Thank you. Paul says, I learned. Somebody say, I learned. Somebody say, I learned. That means he had to walk with the Lord, and he had to walk with him through ups, and he had to walk with him through downs. He had to walk with him through good times. He had to walk with him through bad times. And what he learned is, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he was with me the whole time. Every step I take, every move I make, he's been walking with me. Oh, I wish I had a puff daddy witness up in here in the name of Jesus or Sting, regardless of what generation you're from. One of my favorite songs is, it says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when storms like sea billows roll, here's the line, whatever my lot has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I learned, it taught me, whatever my lot, it taught me to be, it is well with my soul. Somebody say, I learned. I learn how to trust him on good days. I learn how to trust him on bad days. I learn how to trust him when it's good, and I learn how to trust him when it's bad. I learn how to trust him when I was full. I learn how to trust him when I was empty. I learn how to trust him when I had a lot of money. I learn how to trust him when I was broke as a joke. I learn, I learn, and I learn. This is what I learned. I learned to say thank you, Jesus, for the mountains. I learned to say thank you, Jesus, for the 
valleys. I learned to say, thank you, Jesus, for the storms you brought me through. Here's why. If I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that you could solve them. I'd never know what faith in my God could do. So I learned through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend on Jesus, and I've learned to trust in God. If Paul was here, he'd tell you, find your contentment in Jesus, because he can take everything you're going through and say, all things are working together for your good. 